We build worlds inside our minds, populated by every individual we ever met, every memory, every regret. The past is like a legend. Because of the arrow of time, the past does not exist anymore except in our memories. We can't touch it, can't interact with it, can't alter it. The past is something that is extinct. We can only talk about it in history books and recall it in our hazy, misremembered recollections. The allure of the past may have its roots there. Because of its immutability, it's practically mythical. And so, we look back on what once happened to our world, to ourselves, the way we want to remember, perhaps through rose-colored glasses. Film has always explored the past in a variety of different ways. But in recent years, a new art movement in this medium has emerged to better excavate our world history, our personal history, and our film history. Retro films, or facsimile films, there is no officially mandated title, are movies that aim to pay tribute to previous eras in film history, or previous subgenres, that no longer exist, or no longer exist in appearance or in format. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, and in terms of goals it may be even more complicated than that, but at least in structure, this simply means movies made to look like older movies. The rules for this fledgling art movement in film are a little scattershot and ill-defined, but based on what we've seen so far, it appears as if there are two varieties of these retro films. First is the tongue-in-cheek tribute that is partly played for laughs, but still lovingly made as an homage to a forgotten time. Typically, these films only go as far as replicating the appearance of the old movies, or style, but may take place in modern times with modern technology. The second is a replica of an old style of film made in earnest, not as a joke. Typically, great care is made so that everything about it is in line with the year it is replicating. Bear this in mind, this is different from a period film with period costuming. Of course, that is made to look like it takes place in a different time, but it is not necessarily filmed in the same style as before. Planet Terror is a retro film. Pride and Prejudice is a period film. Different. The goals of a tongue-in-cheek retro film and the earnest retro film are usually not the same. The former is made for harmless nostalgia and a few good laughs, but the latter can be used not only to play around with the past, but to examine it. The House of the Devil, for example, examines a moral panic of the 1970s and 80s about satanic rituals and kidnappings for human sacrifice often called the Satanic Panic. This nonsensical notion was that an underground network of Satanists were in control of secular society. In reality, very little, if any, credible evidence was ever uncovered suggesting this was a widespread phenomenon. Satanists exist, yes, but they are not controlling the country or brainwashing politicians or anything like that. It was a giant panic that had little to no basis in reality. Just a lot of anecdotal evidence and blaming real murder on the supernatural. The House of the Devil cuts right to the core of this superstitious belief, and by making it feel as if the film had been shot during the height of the satanic panic, there is an added impact to it. And what of Beyond the Black Rainbow? Well, this film not only wants to put you in mind of the 1980s, but actually spells out exactly when this is happening. And over the course of the movie, we begin to understand why. Beyond the Black Rainbow is the story of the fictional Aboria Institute. Founded in the 1960s by Dr. Aboria, the Institute seeks to uncover the secrets of the human spirit and create harmony, happiness, and inner peace, the mantra that was popular at the time. Though most of the film takes place in the 80s, a time in which the Institute is run by Dr. Aboria's protege, Dr. Nile. The Institute imprisons Elena, a young woman with psychic abilities. Dr. Nile experiments on her, examines her, monitors her telekinetic powers, and generally keeps her captive for his own purposes and research. Flashbacks indicate that Elena actually is the daughter of Dr. Aboria, and that Dr. Nile went insane from an experiment gone wrong. Elena actually escapes the Institute. Critics have called Beyond the Black Rainbow confounding due to its pace and its visuals, but the story is actually pretty straightforward. There's a woman who's held captive by scientists because she has powers, and then she gets out. I'm so sorry that you were never able to meet your mother. So what is the connection between the two time periods, and why does Beyond the Black Rainbow need to feel like the 80s? Well, one flashback takes us to 1966, a time in which the counterculture movement was adopted by America's youth. 
The baby boomer generation, meaning children born shortly after World War II, wanted to believe in a world without the wars of their parents. And for that, and many other reasons, a new age of spiritualism for that day's youth began to emerge, usually disconnected from organized religions mainstreamed in America, mostly a co-opting of Eastern spirituality. And what happened to this generation? Well, they grew up and became bankers and lobbyists and destroyed the environment and the housing market. Such is life. Anyway, this ties into the early 80s, the time period in which the main thrust of the film occurs. Because by this point, the baby boomers were becoming the middle-aged, ruling class of America, the desired marketing demographic and likely voters. In Beyond the Black Rainbow, we follow Dr. Nile and how he relates to all this. Dr. Aboria and Dr. Nile had the best of intentions, admittedly. The Aboria Institute's goals are very much aligned with the 1960s human potential movement, a shared idea that there is a lot of untapped potential waiting inside the human mind or the human soul and that all it needs is a way to come out and save the world from itself. It's a lofty goal. The company introduction clip in the beginning of the film mimics the mantra of the human potential movement almost word for word. It has long been my dream to find the perfect way for people to achieve simply happiness. The Aboria Institute is like a science fiction version of the SLN Institute, a human potential movement retreat. If you've never heard of it, every time something like Mad Men or True Detective showed a weird hippie cult retreat, that's likely the basis of it. Dr. Nile is initially driven to uncover the secrets of the human mind, but in his obsession, he becomes immoral and imprisons a young woman against her will. His chemical dependency on prescription drugs is a reference to the drug culture of the 1960s and how it evolved into something uglier by the 1980s. The generation that believed that expanding the mind would reach the stars somehow perverted this ideal, or were fed a perverted version of that ideal. In this scene, we even see a figurehead of the 80s, Ronald Reagan, present his Star Wars missile defense plan, the collapse of the late 60s dreams and hopes, summed up in one speech about militarizing space, not to mention the fact that it failed. Dr. Niles' plans actually run parallel to those of Reagan, using science to absurd, dangerous means, mixed with an unhealthy amount of paranoia about a looming enemy. When Niall clothes himself in leather, made by a company called Noriega, this is a reference to Manuel Noriega, the military dictator of Panama, and drug kingpin. Much like the setting of this film, he rose to power in 1983. Noriega was illicitly involved with the Reagan administration and the scandalous Iran-Contra affair. Panos Kosmatos, writer and director of Beyond the Black Rainbow, once said in an interview, I've always been fascinated by the occult, to a certain extent. I wouldn't say that I'm obsessive about it or anything like that. For me, the occult stuff came probably from the 60s generation, the baby boomers attempting to find spirituality and also drifting into strange occult and darker areas, sort of corrupting their ideals. I looked into the skull like a black rainbow. Beyond the Black Rainbow is shot and edited to showcase long, laborious shots with few cuts. We are trapped in these frames as much as Elena is trapped in her cell. This kind of connection between audience and subject works very well, and it is all accomplished through the decision to go light on cuts. We live in these shots. The search for a spiritual self in the film, Human Potential, is the search for faith, the search for God, for religion, but also the search for identity. Mirrors and reflections play heavily into the visuals of the film, not to mention Dr. Nile revealing his true form. All this is wrapped up in the search for greater human potential, a lofty goal, but one that can go astray. An inward worldview may also become self-obsessed, by showing the fall of Aborea Institute from the seemingly idealistic 60s to the self-centered 80s. By showing these distinct periods, showering the 80s graininess and the 60s promotional reel in that style, we take that journey through time with the film. We watch everything change and distort. We become trapped in the darkness.